Good morning. Welcome to our third year class. Uh, those of you that aren't available, this is for you today. We're going to talk just a moment about our syllabus. You hope, hopefully you have with you. I want it to be clear that <clears throat> in your syllabus it explains the chapters you must read and you must give a, a excerpt or a short rendition of what you your views are on each chapter and they're due the next month so the one that is today uh, that you're looking at that you need to read before our next class has to be in on uh, the September date uh, we will be going through each one of these books, but, you know, give me your views and what you see concerning each one of these subjects. There is also another book that if you want to read, and it is very uh, helpful for you to understand the price that was paid by uh, our forefathers for this message, because you realize that it wasn't just a rejection of the word but some of the difficulties they faced in order to preach the one God apostolic way. Uh, 20th century Pentecostals, if you look that up and you get a chance to read it, I would suggest you do that. But today we're going to start in chapter 1 of the Oneness of God book, which I, uh, I do believe you have a copy of, and we're going to look at chapter 1 which is on Christian monotheism. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That's Deuteronomy 6 and 4. God is one, Galatians 3 and 20. There is one God. There is only and only has been ever one God. There is a lot of different uh, religions that would like to separate them. Uh, they would uh, like to say there's more than one person of, but there is only one God. There are many manifestations of the one God, which we will see in further chapters, but there is only one God. That's what monotheism means. Monotheism is the fact that, that monos meaning alone or single, and theos meaning God. Okay, just a second, we got Samantha coming in. Good morning, Samantha. All right. <laughs> yeah. So, we're just talking there about chapter one. And just, uh, you do have your syllabus, right, for the oneness of God? I don't think I have it. They should have sent it through to you. I'll make sure they do. Uh, and it explains to you what's required because you do have a short. Uh, writing that's required each month, 700 words on each chapter, all right? Uh, I'll get Sister Wallace to send it to you to make sure. In other words. So we're looking at uh, monotheism and what it is, and it's the fact that there's only one God. If you have your Oneness of God book, and we're going to begin on, on page 14 of that. And monos meaning alone or single or one, and theos meaning God. And atheist is one who denies the existence of God, and an agnostic is one who asserts the existence of God and is unknown and probably unknowable. A pantheist is one who equates God with nature or the forces of the universe, and a polytheist is one who believes in more than one God, and diatheism is the belief in two gods, is a form of polytheism, and then so is tritheism, which is a belief in three gods. So we see here there is a group of people uh, that there is many different um, thoughts. And yes, I have run into each one of these groups. I have uh, dealt with different people in talking with them. Some that believe in two persons in the Godhead, some believe in three, and some believe that he is just a God of many gods. And so, you know, you will get it, uh, those views, but we as apostolics are strictly monotheistic. In other words, we believe there is only one God, many manifestations, which we'll talk about later on. The one that we are most common 
knowledge of is, of course, Trinitarianism. We deal with those on more of a daily basis than, uh, than any other group. But they believe there are three distinct persons in the Godhead. God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Ghost. But yet they say it's one God. There is nowhere in the Bible that the terminology is ever used, God the Son. There is used the Son of God, but never is used the God the Son or God the Holy Ghost. Number one, the first thing that we must realize that God is a spirit according to the Gospel of John. And they that worship him must what? Worship him in spirit and truth. That is in John chapter 4. And we know that. Saying that alone, God is a spirit. Has anybody ever seen a spirit? No. We have seen manifestation of a spirit, but nobody has ever seen a spirit. We have felt the presence or the spirit of God, but we have never, ever, ever seen the spirit of God. And so it's the same thing. The Holy Ghost is what? The spirit of Jesus Christ. And so therefore we have never seen the Holy Ghost. So there, there is no way because the fact remains it is a spirit. The scripture even declares no one has seen a spirit. We can see a manifestation of a spirit. Somebody said, oh, I saw a ghost. But that's all. It's just a manifestation of a spirit. Nobody has ever seen a spirit. But Trinitarianism, they believe in three distinct persons. And and that, when I say that, I mean they believe in three self-conscious beings that all agree in one, they, they, they agree together, they, they act together, everything about them. And that's the whole concept of being one God to them. We believe that He is the Father in creation, as He was. He's the Son in redemption. And He is the Spirit or the Holy Ghost in regeneration because he re regenerates our physical bodies, our spirits. He regenerates us. Anyways, we'll get into that a little bit more further on. Now, by theorism, which is a belief in two persons in the Godhead, and my first contact with somebody that believes that is a group of Mormons. They believe that there is only two persons. They don't believe the Holy Ghost is a physical body. They believe the Father has a physical body, and the Son has a physical body, but not the, the, the Holy Ghost. Uh, there are two different classes of monotheism. The one class is there is only one God, but does so by denying in one way or another that the full deity of Jesus Christ. In other words, they, they relegate Jesus to the position of a created God, or subordinate God, or junior God, or demigod. So, and then there's the second class, which are the true monotheists, which we are. They believe in the fullness of the Godhead is manifested in Jesus Christ according to Scripture. They believe the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are manifestation modes or offices or relationship that the one God has displayed to humans. Because, and we look at that, and we'll look again, and I'll just make mention of that, the fact of Abraham saw God. God spoke to him, talked to him. But was he always in the manifestation as an angel? No. Throughout the scriptures we see different people who, who God came to speak to. But does that mean that he has got another person there or another person? And a, you know, this, we'll talk about this in a little bit. It's called a theophany or a manifestation of one God. So Christendom or the religious world has four basic views of the Godhead. Trinitarianism, binotheism, strict monotheism with a denial of the full deity of Jesus Christ, 
or strict monotheism with the affirmation of the full deity of Jesus Christ or oneness which we are. The Old Testament teaches there is but one God. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Deuteronomy 6 and 4. I, in, in my life, I've had the privilege of uh, spending some time in a Jewish synagogue. I don't know if I made mention of this last uh, term to use, Samantha, but uh, I worked in the city of Frayton, New Brunswick, and I was a heating technician. Uh, and so therefore, when their b boiler would go out, they would have to call me in, and I would have to go into the Jewish synagogue. So I got a chance... And I wasn't even in the church at the time, but I got a chance to talk to the rabbi. And I asked him some questions, and he answered them uh, quite a bit, and quite honestly. And now this one, I don't know if I read it or if uh, he explained it to me. But the one thing I do know is that when a Jewish child is born, the first thing that mother will do when she, when they cut the umbilical cord and, and give that child to the mother, she will raise it to her lips. And the first words that that child will hear is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. That is the first thing that goes into the baby's ears is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Also, when a, a person is dying, and they're getting ready to pass from this life into the other. The rabbi will lean down, or somebody that is close by, that, that if the rabbi is not there, will lean down as they're drawing their last breath and speak into the ears of that person and say, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Those are the last words that a Jewish person will hear if they're dying of natural causes and not by sudden death or anything, but those are the first words and the last words they hear in this life. It's quite extraordinary how impassionate that the Jewish nation is, that, that this is how they begin their life and this is how they end their lives. In Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 5, he commands that the verses be placed in the heart, which is verse 6, taught to the children throughout the day, verse 7, bound on the head and the hand, and written on the post and the gates, verse 9, verse 8. And we know that the Jewish people, I don't know if you've gone into a Jewish home, but if you look, there will be a little, a little, about this large, well, about this long, nailed to the side doorpost, it's usually on the right-hand side of their home. And when you walk in with the Jewish, and if you, if you ever get the privilege, go in, because you not very seldom a Gentile is invited into a Jewish home. But if you ever do, or you walk by, and you'll see it on the door, and every time they enter the door, they'll rub their hand over it. And what it says is, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. That's the call, the Shama. And so they, they have it there, so they take this, this scripture literally. But it's in their hearts. It's on the gates of their house. It's a re constant reminder of who God is. And, and, and the, the thing is, they teach it to their children throughout the day. In other words, it's not just a one-time thing, but all the time the child is growing up. Uh, uh, I was in a position once where we were doing some children's service, my wife and I. And, 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 and at the, one of the services, I noticed this little boy sitting in the back and and you could tell the Lord was dealing with there were big tears rolling down his cheek. And, and I walked back to him, and he was about five, four or five years old. And, and I said to him, I said, young man, I said, would you like to pray? And he looked at me with these big eyes. He said, sir, he said, I don't know how to pray. And I thought to myself, how sad that this child is four or five years old, and, and his mom and his daddy has never taught him about the Lord Jesus Christ has never taught him how to, he could take some time to pray with him. Oh, we don't have to spend, you know, two or three hours like we, we would do or a half hour or whatever. But, you know, even a couple minutes praying with our children and talk, teaching them that they need to lean upon the one true God. This is what the Jewish or Judaism is to them. They are not ashamed of who they are. They are not ashamed of what they believe, but they speak it fully and continuously to their children day in and day out. Another thing that I, this I do know I found out while I was in the Jewish synagogue 
when the rabbi, when I, one of the times I had to go in there, I, I was in there probably three or four times. And the one time I heard a group of, of children, uh, what I thought was chanting, but they were speaking in Hebrew. And when I say that they learn about him, uh, I, I looked at the rabbi, I said, you've you got a class going on? He said, oh, he said, you know, he said every day, this is in the second brother, he said every day, the children get out of school, the secular school, at 3.30. I said, yes, they do. He said, but they have one hour to get from their secular school to here, to the Hebrew school. And he said, and, and they spend from here, from 4.30 till 8.30 at night, learning the first five books of the Old Testament. I said, wow, they, 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 they teach it to their children. And, 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 and the, the, after they've been in secular school for six to eight hours, they are going to Hebrew school because when they reach 13 years of age and they have their bar mitzvah, they need to be able to quote the first five books of the Old Testament. Wow. So they, they place a lot of emphasis on learning the Word of God. The Orthodox Jews literally obey these commands today by binding teflon or silicaries on their left forearm here or on their forehead. You ever, I don't know if you've seen an Orthodox Jew, but they will have a strap and they'll have this little wooden box and inside it are the words, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. When, when they pray, uh, they... The boxes are tied to the body by leather straps and all these things. And they carry this with them day in, day out. I've met them and uh, it's, it's quite interesting. Matter of fact, I don't know if you noticed the conference, there was quite a few Orthodox Jews in the area. And you could tell because of the way they were dressed and the way their hairstyle was and everything else. But when you realize what they believe, they believe the same as what we do, that there is only one God. Uh, the one thing I do know about the Word of God is that in Isaiah, Isaiah is one of the most beautiful books as far as I'm concerned in the Bible about talking about there is only one God. Uh, it talks about that there was no God formed before me, neither shall it be after me. I am the first, I am the last. Throughout Isaiah, he declares time and time again that there is none but him. And when you, when you look through that, you will realize just how much Isaiah proclaimed or believed that there was only one God. The Jewish people do not understand a theology of persons. They believe God is a spirit. They are still looking for their Messiah. They believe the scriptures that it is going to happen. And they believe he is going to come down and he is going to be a wealthy person. He's going to take control of things, all these things. And that's why Jesus, when he proclaimed to them that, you know, they didn't accept him as their Messiah, but the one who would come in his own name, they were going to accept them as their Messiah. Of course, until the time when uh, the false Messiah, you know, offers up uh, or desecrates the temple is what he does. When we th look throughout the Word of God, we see him declared. When we think about ourselves, we need to really grasp a hold of who He is. When we think about Jesus Christ, we need to understand that there is a dual nature. And I've and, and I, I got to be careful because that's over in, in chapter 2, which we'll talk about probably in the next few moments. We'll go through the first couple of chapters here. But... When we start talking about who God is, we don't think of Him in any one uh, concept. We won't think of Him just as the Father, at, because He is the, our Heavenly Father. We don't think of Him just as Jesus Christ, because that was the body He took on so that 
his blood could be shed because God does not have blood, so he had to take on the form of man. That's why the Bible says he thought it not robbery to take on the form of man because he needed blood, pure blood, innocent blood to be shed to cover man's sin. And we understand the role of the Son. And we understand the role of the, of the Holy Ghost or the Spirit of Christ because it is a portion of God's Spirit living within us to direct us, to, to lead us into His Word, into, his, into a walk in this life because He knows what man is made of because He did what? He robed Himself in flesh so He could feel our infirmities. He knows what, how difficult it is for us to not tell a lie. He knows how difficult it is to have evil thoughts. He knows how difficult it is for us to have the lust of the flesh. He knows how difficult it is for us to do the things that we do in this body. That's why he robed himself in flesh. So that he could understand. Because as God, he doesn't have any of those feelings. He doesn't have any of those temptations. He doesn't have any of those emotions. But as man, he felt them. He was, the Bible says, he was tempted in all ways, yet did not sin. There's only one who could not sin, and that is God himself. And so therefore he robed himself in flesh to take away the sins of the world. When we understand that, we're not just talking to, or we're not just praying to, but we are speaking to God, our Creator. And when we ask everything in the name of Jesus Christ, which is referring to the Sonship, He honors it because that is His name. When you look through the whole Testament, you will see that, that God, little by little, revealed himself. He was to Moses, the great I Am. And then on Father Abraham, Jehovah, and Jehovah Nissi, Jehovah, all throughout the Old Testament, we're going to go into all those compounding, he began to reveal himself little by little until he finally came and revealed his name, which is Jesus, which is simply salvation. When he revealed who he was, because God is the only one who can save us. There is none other. There is, we have none. There is no God else beside me, a just God and a Savior. There is none beside me. Look unto me, and ye shall be saved all the ends of the earth. For I am God, and there is none else. Isaiah 45, 21, and 22. So we see that the relationship that this was all about was so that we could know who God is. We you know we sing the songs and all that, and but and, and we we sing the song. I'm a one God apostolic tongue talking holy roller, heaven bound believer in the liberated power of uh, uh, of God in Jesus name. Uh, all these things that we talk about, it's all in Him. The fullness of the God, it is all in Him. All these old songs and stuff like that. But we do it because we know who He is. Jesus emphatically taught Deuteronomy 6 4, calling it the first of all commandments when we read Mark 12 29 and 30. Which see, it says, you know, thou shalt what? Worship the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might, with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. And then thou shalt love thy brother as thyself, thy neighbor as thyself. Uh, upon these hang all the commandments of God. Because when you do that, when you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, you will love your brother as your style. Bible calls God the Holy One, 1 John 2 and 20, and there's a throne in heaven and one that sits upon it. You notice that there's one that sits upon it. Now, I don't know if you've ever looked at this and some of the things that we see. Have you got your Bible handy? So 
Samantha? Oh, you froze up on me. Have you got your Bible there? Yes. Okay, open up the Revelations. Revelations. Now, verse 1 of chapter 5. Now, watch this. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a book written within and on the backside sealed with seven seals. Who's that talking about? Is it? Huh? Yes, we do. We, in most terminology, we would use the terminology God, right? Okay. Now read verse 6. You read it to me. Mm -hmm. Verse 7. And he came and took the book out of the right hand of him that sat upon the throne. Now, if you read that really quickly, it just sounds like that there's two persons. But I want you to read verse 6 again, but slowly, the first line. What's it say? And I beheld in the midst of Hold it. So in other words, what's that saying? Out of him who's sitting on the throne. Watch it. Out of him who's sitting on the throne. Came out who? The Lamb. Isn't that powerful? You see what I mean? It's just, it's, you've got to sometimes, you just got to read the scripture. So, because when we look at it, we say, Lo, in the midst of the throne, or in the midst of the Father, came the Lamb, who stood in the midst of the elders. And he would... This is why it's so important. But if we read it quickly, when we look at verse 1 and verse 6, it looks, oh wow, there's two persons here. But it's not, because it's out of God came the Lamb. Isn't that awesome? That's just a little tidbit I found when I was reading. But it's just so beautiful when you begin to understand the Word of God and see who God is and what He has done for us. He is our Savior. Now, we're going to look at chapter 2. And I don't know if I'll get all the way through it, but there's some of these chapters I know I won't get all the way through, so that's why we'll do as many as we do as we go along. All right. Chapter 2, which is uh, talks about the nature of God. God has a nature. Did you know that? God is a spirit, and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and truth. John 4, 24. And so we begin to look at the fact that God is what? A spirit. Genesis 1 and 2 says, And the spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And the spirit and the bride say, Come. Hebrews 12, I mean Revelation 22, 70. And Hebrews 12 and 9 calls the God the father of spirits. What is a spirit? A supernatural, incorporeal, rational being, invisible to human beings, but having the power to become visible at will. Isn't that, that sounds just like God. Uh, it, it means wind, breath, life, anger, unsubstantiality, region of the sky, or spirit of a rational being. The Greek word translated as spirit is pneuma, and it current of air, breath, blast, breeze, spirit, soul, vital, principle, disposition, angel, demon, or God. But the fact of the matter is, God is a spirit, and God is invisible. Oh, is that too loud? No, no, no. I'll just I'll close the door just a little bit. Okay. Yeah, you, your voice is perfect. Yeah, that's okay. You can close it all the way if it's too loud. God is a spirit. He is invisible unless he wants to reveal himself to someone for a particular purpose. 
God told Moses, Thou shalt not see my face, for there no man shall see me and live. And Bible says that no man has seen God at any time. John 1 and 18, 1 John 4 and 12. Not only has no human ever seen God, but no human can see God. 1 Timothy 6, 16. The only way that we can see God is if he appears in various forms, but nobody can see the invisible God. Jesus made the statement that nobody has seen God, but yet he or the flesh or the humanity declares him. And so we know that as a spirit, nobody can. So therefore, how can you put God into a physical body if he is a spirit and can't be seen? This is where this, the, the Trinitarian or the Bithyism does not prove true. God is what? Omnipresent. In other words, he's everywhere's present. Because he is a spirit, he can be everywhere at the same time. He is the only spirit that is truly omnipresent for all other spirit beings such as demons, angels, Satan himself, are all confined to what? One singular space. That's why when we blame the devil for the things we do in our flesh, we're giving the devil too much credit. Because he's only in one place. And you cannot give the devil credit. He'll accept it. Because he takes that as worship when you give him credit. But the fact of the matter is we sin because we're drawn away by our own lusts. And we're dealing with our flesh. Uh, God is everywhere present, but does that mean that he's just sitting there waiting to trounce on us every time we do something wrong? No. He, he loves us and he, and he stirs us and he draws us. He is everywhere's presence. Psalms 139, verse 7 through 13 explains it so very well. He says, Whether shall I go from thy spirit? Or whether shall I flee from thy presence? If I send up into heaven, thou art there. If I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there. If I take the wings of the morning and dwell in the uttermost parts of the sea, even there shall thy hand lead me, and thy right hand shall hold me. If I say, surely the darkness shall cover me, even the night shall be light about me. Yea, the darkness hideth not from thee, but the night shineth as the day. The darkness and the light are both alike to thee, for thou hast possessed my reins and hast covered me in my mother's womb. David said, Behold, I was born and shapen in iniquity. Thou hast known me from my mother's womb. Why does the Bible describe him as being in heaven? If he's everywhere's present. Number one, we as humans need to think of God in heaven so that we can what? Understand God. Why? Because we have our minds are finite in the sense that we we need to be able to put, I don't like to say it this way, but it is true. We like to put God in a box so that we can understand. But in actual fact, we can't put God in the box because he's everywhere. But we do it so that we can say, okay, this is God. But the reason when we talk about he's heaven, this teaches that God is transcendent. In other words, he's beyond human understanding and he is not limited to this earth. It refers to the center of God's reasoning and activity, immediate presence, and it may refer to the visible manifestation of God to the angels in heaven. So, when we talk about that, we understand that. Because our minds need to be able to comprehend God. Because we think, and, and then it's so funny, even scientists will say it. You know, I don't, I don't believe something unless I what, see it. We believe something and we don't see it. 